your nutritional deficiencies are a result of your movement and nature deficiencies. That if you were extracting your food directly with your body, directly from the landscape, you would have the most nutritious, nature-rich, movement-rich version. But as we've pulled ourselves in and away from nature and foods that come from nature and using movements that come from nature, now everything's sort of synthetic and separate. So we live in, our dwellings are sort of synthetic. The foods are synthetic, meaning that they're not whole. I mean, like, I guess you can just use the same way that you perceive whole food, this idea that it's not only not so packaged, but it hasn't been processed, right? It looks, it looks very close to its source in nature. And so that's the same thing for movements, right? We're looking for the movements that look very close to a human just moving through nature because that's their source, of course. From the Weston A. Price Foundation, welcome to the Wise Traditions podcast for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. We are your source for scientific knowledge and traditional wisdom to help you achieve optimal health. Hey, Hilda here. Many conveniences are available to us 24-7. Washing machines, cars, dishwashers, even deliveries at the click of a button or even just a word to Alexa. But we may have sacrificed something essential at the altar of convenience, and that is movement. This is episode 313, and our guest today is biomechanist and speaker Katie Bowman, the author of Move Your DNA and Wild Child. Today, Katie invites us to return to movement. She explores how we came to be such sedentary people, mostly indoors for the better part of the day. And this is true, of course, for adults and children alike. We all have movement deficiencies. And Katie explains how this is essentially a nutritional deficit of sorts. She also offers ideas for what we can do to change our movement habits for the better. She suggests that we make small environmental changes like limiting screen time, switching positions when we're on our computers and such. And each of those changes can help us move a little bit more. She also makes a strong case for diversity of movement, and she explains how that nourishes our body in ways we may not have anticipated. Before we get into it, I want to invite you to join our email list. Go to our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the bright yellow button on our homepage. This way you can stay abreast of all that we're up to, including upcoming events and the like. And remember that we here at the Weston A. Price Foundation are committed to research, education, and activism, and projects like this podcast. We count on your gifts and support to keep afloat, really. If you appreciate what we do, please make a gift of any size. Just go to westonaprice.org slash donate to give a gift or donate to us directly through PayPal using the email address info at westonaprice.org. Thank you so much for your support. It really means a lot. This is Holistic Hilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. Welcome to Wise Traditions, Katie. Hi, thank you for having me. I am so excited to talk to you. I have heard about you ever since you wrote Move Your DNA, and you've got the Dynamic Aging book, and your latest book, Grow Wild, The Whole Child, Whole Family, Nature Rich Guide to Moving Forward, is phenomenal. What motivated you to write this book? You know, I have spent 20 years working with adults who found that they were missing certain movements in their life. You know, either there's a spectrum of movement. You know, some people are not active at all. Some people are very regular with their exercise. And then some people are very regular with their exercise, but really only one modality of exercise. So that whole spectrum of people sort of wound up finding their way to meet for a better, the easiest way I can say would be a better balanced movement diet. They were missing certain movement nutrients. (laughs) And I think that they didn't really understand, one, the importance of movement, and two, the diversity of movements needed, different movements for the body. And, you know, by the time they came to me, they're usually 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90. And every one of them was just like, man, if I had known this at a younger age, or if I had been raised in an environment that better supported me physically in this way, I wouldn't necessarily be having the ailments or the physical expressions of movement malnutrition, I guess, if you will. So then after working with 
thousands of adults for 20 years, I thought, well, how about I then create the book so that we could start off kids on a better physical foot and really explain the importance of movement, sort of as I did in Move Your DNA, really just the distinction between exercise and movement, because they're not the same thing. And then how would you raise a dynamic kid and or a kid that was fluent in movement? Because it really is the environment. You know, kids don't need exercise like we have come to use exercise. They just need a lot of permission and space to move. And I've always found that through understanding how movement works, people are much more willing to create those environments and prioritize movement. So that's what this book is. It's the book to, if you wanted to start yourself off on a more nourishing movement culture, this hopefully is the toolbox. Well, I can relate so much to what you're speaking about because I was a fitness professional teaching exercise classes several days a week. I would do that. And I feel like I would hardly move the rest of the day. I'd spend the rest of my day seated at a computer. Maybe I'd stand in the kitchen preparing a meal, but I wasn't in that movement rich environment that we were made for. And you say in your book that we've actually, most of us have opted for convenience over that movement rich environment. Can you explain that a little bit more? Well, and it's a cultural phenomenon. You know, I'm trying to explain that we we live in a sedentary culture. We can't even see really what movement is yet because it's been almost all eradicated from our lives. And so what I mean by we're opting for convenience is most of the advances that we've made as a culture, technological advances, that so many of them are actually tethered up with reduces the amount of movement we need to do for the things that we require. I mean, it's that's just it sort of in a in a nutshell. And we're not used to viewing convenience this way. We're used to con- viewing convenience in terms of saving us time. So like we'll pick this over that because like this saves us time. But the point that I tried to make in a book that I wrote Movement Matters is While we have been able to create the technologies and environments that got rid of the movement that used to occur, like we would exchange our movement for the thing at the Mm -hmm. most fundamental level, that even though we've been able to, we're sophisticated enough to create these environments, we have not done a thing about the fact that our bodies still required all of that movement. We can get rid of it from the environment but we can't get rid of the need for it in our bodies. The paradox is that we're hardwired for lots of movement and we're also hardwired to move as little as possible, just being natural beings. Like that's all natural elements default is, you know, try to conserve energy. So as we've like made these amazing environments at the end of the day, we didn't move at all. And yet our movement requirement is still the same as it was 60,000 years ago. And so we haven't saved time because now I still have six hours of movement that I needed and there's no place for it anymore. So that convenience didn't really save me time. It just saved me temporarily the movement to get what I needed. And now I have this slow, we all culturally have this slowly amassing deficit in our personal movement and no cultural place where the movement fits in anymore. This makes so much sense to me. I am picturing people that I've met in villages who the women walk down to the river to wash the clothes, you know, and the whole action of beating the clothing against the rock, you know, and then coming back and then you need water for your family to drink. So you're going to go to the well. And so they're using their bodies to do these things. Whereas we have tap water, we have a washing machine and we think we're so modern. And as you said, it saved us time, but only in the short term, because we still need to move, right? Yeah, I mean, that's exactly it. And it's just that not having to go wash the laundry by hand and and do that walk, it then allows us to advance in other ways, but we are behind on the movement parts. So it's just that. It's really hard at first to see the movement that we're losing in certain things. But being a biomechanist, which is my training, it's how I see everything, right? Like my famous example of it. And sometimes we opt for convenience that really doesn't get us a darn thing. So like one of those examples would be like a key fob. You know, the fact that you just push a tiny button to unlock your car versus do the very minute motion of sliding your key in and turning it, right? This idea that leaning over across the seat to unlock someone's door versus the new technological, just flick a button 
on the driver's side to open up all the doors. So there are ways that we look for saving movement that makes sense, that free up people from tasks that they don't want to do or don't feel that they should have to do. And then there's just the completely doesn't really do much at all, except now require that every single person who has a car also has a battery, also has a plastic widget, and then no longer do these other simple motions. So there's definitely a spectrum of ways that different technologies move us less or more. But the fact is almost all of them are taking away some sort of physical labor from our bodies. And we need to deal with it because it's very tied up with not only our individual well-being, It's tied up with how many resources we now extract in order to be sedentary. So you'd think that sedentary groups would consume less, but sedentary groups actually consume more because the infrastructure required to be sedentary is quite robust. What do you mean? I mean that if I'm going to go walk to the river to wash my clothes, I'm walking over natural ground, I'm using rocks, I'm using river water. If I have a washing machine, everything that goes into bringing the washing machine to be is mining the earth in some other places. It's plastic knobs, it's metal, it's manufacturing, it's shipping. It's the footprint of washing in these two different ways are quite different, right? It's not only that they're different in movement, It's the robusticity, the infrastructure to bring you a washing machine versus you walk to a body of water to wash your clothes differ in more ways than just one is movement rich and one is movement poor. And so every single safe movement technology has massive hardware and massive hardware that needs to be regularly replaced. So it's just we're at the point now of consuming where we're not really recognizing, like if you are eco-conscious or eco-aware and you're, you're thinking about some of these things where we don't tend to focus so much is how many of the, you know, if we just talk about in the book, in the afterward, I write sort of about a carbon footprint. We don't really assess a carbon footprint as what is the stand-in for our lack of motion, individual motion, like the group that consumes the most and has the biggest footprint is the group that's moving physically the least. Wow, I'm processing what you're saying, and it's actually reminding me a lot of the work of Alan Savory, you know, the wildlife biologist from Zimbabwe. He talks about holistic management, and you're kind of giving us, Katie, a bigger picture paradigm from which to look at our choices, you know, not only the lack of movement, like you said, but what happens when we choose convenience over what may be more natural and better for the earth. It's fascinating. And how can we Do you think step out of this mindset that convenience over everything? Um, Well, I've chosen to frame it. I mean, it's very hard to not choose convenience over everything because we live in a very fast paced society very now, more so than ever, and it's accelerating. And to keep up with sort of what we perceive we need to be able to do, it moves very fast. And convenience does save us time in the sense that we're not considering our movement, right? So I was like, I can do more in a day. We're all sort of trying to meet all of our needs individually, which is why I talk so much about this idea of movement permaculture, this idea of stacking and compartmentalization. We're all trying to multitask. And so if this is all just to say that, like, I totally understand, you know, I'm, I work full time and I have two children under 10 And I understand why we make the choices that we make. I feel the pressure to make them as well. So what I've chosen to do with all of my books and sort of all of my career is frame that asking people to sacrifice is very challenging. So Mm. instead of looking at it as a sacrifice, look at it as a way of actually accomplishing more of the things that you yourself want on paper. So I hated chores growing up. I just felt like chores were extremely, you know, to a child's mind, they're oppressive in nature. They're taking you away from what you're wanting to do. There's all this like sense of have to. But as I got older, you know, and I grew into really loving physical fitness and, and movement and feeling competent with my physical body, I realized that avoiding chores, that, that chores were like, wow. I can actually work on my physicality right now. I can stack wood and be happy about it, not see it as something that I have to do. We're so in the exercise mindset 
that we will drive to a place to pretend carry and throw things around, (laughs) but not want to actually do that sort of labor for our own needs. Like we feel differently about it. There's a psychology to when something is choice or leisure based versus something is what I call labor, a physical necessity. So I'm really just trying to reframe that to say, if you could look at the opportunities in your life that they are actually nourishing you when you change your psychology about it, you're going to be stepping into your physical labor, choosing less convenience and seeing it as a positive choice, not seeing it as I'm going to choose the harder thing. No, you're choosing the, you're choosing the thing that's more what you wanted, right? So it's just, again, it's that, it's that subtle psychological shift. Your arm motions are going to be the same. And yeah, recognize the benefit. I mean, it's just seeing that it's a personal benefit to you works for some people. For other people, it's they're not necessarily um, interested only in making themselves better. Some people really think on the community or societal level or the species level. So identify who you are. Do you feel mm-hmm. best taking care of yourself individually or your family or your community or your society or your species? Because these are all different scales at looking at the problem and then just frame your individual action as benefiting those populations, and then it's easier. And you mentioned a moment ago, Katie, that movement can be nourishing or is nourishment in a way. Can you explain that a little more? Well, my company is Nutritious Movement, and there's two reasons I choose that as a name. One, because, and this you'll find this in movie or DNA, is the framework for nutrition that's been established, that took hundreds of years to be established, is where people best understand that it's not only that you need to eat. Like eating calories is not the only objective of food, that there's more to food than calories. It gets more nuanced. It's like, well, there are macronutrients. So you need to make sure that you're eating not only calories, but your calories are coming from these macronutrient categories. And I mean, fat and protein and carbohydrates. But then at another 200 years of investigation, it's like, okay, well, it's actually not even only these three categories. There are smaller categories of things that are coming from our food. We call these chemical compounds. And I have to make sure I get those too, because even if you had adequate calories, and even if you had a good breakdown of your macronutrients, you can still be ill when you are not consuming one or two of these micronutrients, right? And then there's trace minerals. So we just keep refining this idea that there was more in eating that we realized. What defines something as a nutrient is that in its absence, in this compound's absence, there are predictable symptoms that occur across most physiologies And that when you reintroduce the compound back in, those symptoms go away. When we use the word nutrient, that's what we mean. That's how it's defined. So nutrients are always discovered in hindsight. Where we are with movement right now is where we were with food five to 600 years ago. Hmm. We are at that everyone should move more, period, which would be equal (laughs) to like nobody should starve. Everyone needs to eat, which is great. But there are categories of movement that we also need to make sure that we get. Nutritious movement was capitalizing on that framework to say, no, there are actual macronutrients to movement, and then there are micronutrients to movement. So it was to use that framework. But the second reason I'm using it is because I believe in and argue, and that's it's my own scientific work, to establish the fact that movement is also a literal nutrient. Not, it's not just the metaphor of it for food Mm -hmm. that, you know, you eat a chemical compound, it's changing the behavior of some cells through that process. Well, we don't eat movement and movement is not chemical at first, it's mechanical. But when you mechanically change the shape of your body, you bend your arm, you pick something up, your cells have to, you know, when you bend your arm, you're bending the tissues of your arm, which in turn, move the cells of those tissues. And so as cells are bent and squished and twisted, what happens inside those cells is that mechanical input becomes chemical. And on the chemical level, based on how you bend, where you bend, how you move, where you move, each one of those movements has a unique chemical created by either systemically or locally 
And so it works just like a nutrient does, a dietary nutrient. Mechanical nutrients are just like dietary nutrients. The process is a little bit different. But once you get the movement, you know, air quotes, in the body, those cells are now responding to it. And so we know that there are very predictable outcomes of people who are movement starved. And then, Mm -hmm. you know, if you're a physio listening or if you've ever gone to physical therapy, a physical therapist is saying, oh, well, when you, you know, move your arm in this way, I notice that the form that you're doing, you know, the fact that maybe when you raise your arm, your shoulder blade also lifts or your elbow flips out to the side or some sort of just minute little rotation that over time, that minute rotation is leaving some areas overmoved and some areas undermoved. So in the same way, a dietitian will say, well, you're actually consuming too much of this nutrient and not enough of that nutrient. And they are going to take you off some of what you're eating and add in some things that you weren't eating. That's essentially what a physical therapist or sometimes a trainer is also doing as well, right? They're looking at the way that you're moving and saying, you're moving this too much and you're not moving this enough. And like dietary nutrients, there's no idea out there that if a nutrient is good, then an endless consumption of it is good. It's all based (laughs) on an amount. It's all based on an amount and a relationship with other nutrients and movement is the same. So that's a very long winded answer to say, that's why I say it's a nutrient because one, it is. And two, it helps the listener go, I never really thought of myself as having a movement diet before. I know that I get exercise every day, or I know that I should, air quotes around should, exercise every day. But I hadn't really thought of there being more than a mode of exercise like running or, you know, taking the class that I like to take. I hadn't really thought about that maybe I have sedentary areas within an otherwise exercising body. Or maybe I'm very active, but I'm not actually getting enough of this specific movement vitamin. It just is a framework that allows people to really uh, take good control over their mechanical nutrition. I like this concept. I like this approach. And I know you can't analyze each listener, but I would love to hear more about these very categories or vitamins in a way that some of us may be missing in our movement nutrition. Yeah. I mean, so that's hard. It's like the framework is sort of emerging, but, but I would say that generally fitness right now for 20 years, oh gosh, 30, 40 years. I can't believe I'm that old now, but 40 years, <laughs> you know, fitness has said, you know, it's not only exercise, right? You want to get some stretching and you want to get some strength and you want to get some cardio, right? So those are attempts at macronutrient categories. Um, Without getting too, I guess, deep in the weeds here, what I would say is you could consider that every one of your joints needs to be moved. And so if you wanted to look at something on a more micro scale, you could look at your mode of exercise. And this is, so I did, this is why I called out that section activities and grow wild. How do you assess your movement diet? Well, how to do that is in the activity section and grow wild. You're doing it for your kids. You're going, okay, well, my kid does this. My kid loves riding their bike and like, that's okay. But as far as a skeleton goes, it's not actually a great form of movement because the skeleton has different needs, specific loads it needs where not being weight bearing all the time, like, so if you only swim or you only bicycle or do other things on wheels, you're not actually, it's not as nourishing of a food, if you will, or it only has Mm -hmm. certain nutrients. So you have to look at like, what are my weight bearing activities, meaning upright and carrying weight for definitely for children and certainly for um, older folks as well. This idea of like, how much impact do I have because my bones really need that to thrive. And then do your shoulders and your elbows and your wrists all get moved in certain ways? Are you already showing signs of movement malnutrition where you can't be on your wrists, which would be like a symptom of I've been on my wrists so long, you know, people will go to exercise and they find that they can't be on their wrists for more than a minute or two. Like that's a sign that the wrists need attention. And so you would tend to go to physical therapy and they would give you all these smaller motions or teach you how to use your shoulders and rehab or or regenerate those parts. I, I really like regenerative agriculture are things that you can take that framework and really just put it over your whole body. We, We haven't been doing things that sort of add the nutrition back into our movement habits. So sort of restoring or regenerating is helpful. Walking to me, like, so in, in move your DNA again, my framework is evolutionary biology. So the fact that 
we haven't been doing what we're doing as humans for very long. So like, Mm -hmm. even though it feels like this is what humans do, if you look at the human timeline, which is quite long, we're total outliers of behavior. (laughs) We're penguins, if you consider the entire (laughs) bird family, right? So that's a common analogy to say. You don't want to look around and assume that everyone is behaving in a way that's necessarily suiting the body, even though that almost everyone is behaving in a a very similar way. So I would use what are the baseline human movements? I'm also a, a wild animal tracker as a hobby. And so we often work with baselines, baseline gates and rates of walking and biomechanists do something similar for humans, although it's more influenced by culture than it should be. Walking, squatting, being able to carry something as you're walking, like that you have the arm strength to be able to do that. Being able to cross a set of monkey bars, right? That your your hands, elbows, and shoulders have a strength to weight ratio of just your body weight. Those are really simple, old categories of movement that have been across the human board for a very long time. And only in I mean, like they've all been slowly depleting over the last couple hundred of years. Like we, you know, we had the agricultural revolution and then we had the industrial revolution and then we had the computer, home computer revolution. And now we have something new, which is the fact that almost every single human, including infants, will have a technological device in their hand. And what that does is it really, really, really takes the movement down a notch more so than any other of one of these transitions has done. Like it's just eradicated every, I mean, at the beginning of move your DNA, I'm like, at this point you can buy a house, like you can find shelter pushing a button on your phone. You can find a mate pushing on your phone. Your food arrives already made at your door with a push button. I mean, well, there's no other needs left. They're all a swipe away. So what happens to a culture when you make every single need involve only a small motion of the finger and thumb is you have unprecedented physical consequences that this generation of children will be the first one living this reality. They're the first one in this environment, the first group in this environment, and we're the first group parenting them. So it's like a brand new landscape. It's like we all just landed on the moon and we're going to wait. Coming up, Katie gives us advice on how to reverse movement deficiencies. She explains what types of movement we should include in our lives and the movement that she recommends the most above all. You're listening to the Wise Traditions podcast from the Weston A. Price Foundation. We pause now to recognize our sponsors. Rate and review our podcast. At the end of every podcast episode, we read a recent letter to the editor from our journal or a podcast review from Apple Podcasts. If you like the show, just take a second and go to Apple Podcasts and leave us a review with five stars or more if possible. I'll put a link in the show notes to make it easy to get there. And thank you in advance. Also, I want to alert you to the fact that we have a free info pack that gives you background on the foundation, along with our most popular brochure, Timeless Principles of Healthy Traditional Diets. Just go to westonaprice.org and click on the free info pack button. That is a gift to you. This is Holistic Kilda, and you're listening to Wise Traditions. The movement deprivation is real. It's been a while since I've eaten out in a restaurant, but when I used to do it, you know, you'd see these children with iPads or phones. Again, the parents are using them as pacifiers. And so they're not squirming. They're not crawling under the table, which includes movement right? They're staring at something. And I don't think we've realized what we're doing to them. So let's talk about kids a little bit. Right now, a lot of them are actually doing virtual learning as well. What can we do to take away the pull of that convenience and that little pacifier and get them moving again? If you looked at it like food, then you could say, okay, for school, maybe my kids had to do so many hours of learning, but look at their body position. So you could, you could also say it's really hard because I mean, again, as I wrote in Grow Wild, I break down everything into uh, variables. Like that's just my natural way of doing things. So what is a device exactly? Okay. I think in things in terms of movement for the eyeballs, most people don't really know this, but when you look at something up close, you have ranges of different muscles in your eyes, not only the muscles that look to the right, to the left, up and down. But there are a ring of muscles inside your eyeballs that have to contract to focus on something. And their diameter 
or an easier way maybe to think about it, like maybe their circumference, the size of that ring, the closer the thing that you're focusing on, the smaller that ring. So just go ahead and take your your arm and bend it like you're doing a bicep curl. So the closer Mm -hmm. you're looking at something, the tighter and shorter that muscle is. And then when you look at something and focus on something far away, the longest position it is in. So in order to use the full range of motion of the eyes, you have to be able to focus on things and focus on things that are really far away, like a mile away, half mile away, a quarter mile away, 500 feet away, 200 feet away. But the reality is right now, again, unprecedented times were already upon us in 2019. And then we have these new unprecedented times, unprecedented squared. Now you're like, if you just evaluated, and this is also in the Grow Wild activities, what is the distance that your eyes can see and are doing during this activity? So if you looked at schoolwork for right now, for many people, a computer is 30 inches or two feet from someone's face. So Mm -hmm. that means their eyes are sitting in a very contracted position all day long. So one way to balance, you can't really balance the eyes, but you could also look at the whole body shape and say, okay, so maybe the child's on a device right now, but do they have to be in that chair? Could they be standing? Could they be standing on a wobble board? Can I change their workspace? Maybe every day move some things into the kitchen so they can stand while they're doing it. Can I give them a ball to sit on, right? So you're trying to break up the repetitive positioning associated with the task. And then the other thing would be, look at the time around schooling, let's just say. If you've put most of the things that all of us require to participate in the society online, then even though it may be used to be like a pediatric recommendation that there was no more than two hours of online time a day for kids for their biology, If the culture makes a different decision, then really that biological guideline should hold, which would give a culture a way of assessing itself of whether or not it's going in the right direction for the physical well-being of the people that make it up. But we have a sliding baseline problem, which is like, well, we can't really say that you should only go online two hours a day if we know that kids also need schooling and kids also need community. And the only way to get that is online. So then the baseline for online time just goes up and up and up until everyone's like, I'm still operating within the guidelines. Only now the guidelines are six hours a day, but biologically, we're moving, they're, right, yeah, so, we're so, moving the goalposts. <laughs> yeah, and so biology, we just say it's a sliding baseline. It's really hard to evaluate the same thing over time If you keep changing the variables that way, it makes it almost impossible to see the decline of an entire group biologically, physically is my perspective here. So that's just to say, like, just keep objective tabs on it and try to eliminate screen time the rest of the time. So maybe your family, everyone went to school all day and you went to work all day and then you came home and you enjoyed screen time together maybe it's time for a different what we do together since everyone's online time is their work and school time. So like to feel free to adapt other things. Maybe now what used to be sit around and watch Netflix in the evening is family walk time. It's like, look, I'm online all day for work. You're online all day for school. We're switching to game family. And now we just go out to a park and hang out there for three hours in the night instead of watch TV. Because that would be the balanced diet approach of going, I shifted my online calories to meet my school and work needs versus my entertainment needs. So I'm going to have to flip it, right? That, that, that would be how a nutritionist would sort of try to balance a diet for you. Yeah. And then also move before you sit down. You know, we get up and we go right to sitting down on the computer. So again, changing that family culture a little bit to say, we're all going to need to go to bed a half an hour earlier because we all need to wake up a half an hour earlier because we're going to take a walk and go outside, or we're going to have a jump rope contest, or we're going to play a little bit before we all go into our online offices. We just have to be proactive in that way. And that's where you're sort of working against the human grain, right? Because the human nature is like, no, just sit there. It's going to be fine. You're going to conserve energy. You're going to survive. It's like that works in a different environment. That doesn't work in this environment. So you're going to have to muster maybe even write down on a piece of paper and tape it by your door. We want to walk for 20 minutes outside or throw a Frisbee or play. We want to do this before we sit down. We will feel better if we do this before we sit down. So it's just that. It's creating these other family guidelines 
to sort of, you have to be malleable enough as an individual and as a unit of family or whatever, an office or whatever group of people is dealing with this issue to say, if some things have changed, like we're all on the computer for five hours now, then other things have to change too to balance it. So like, don't be afraid to let go of other routines that you had that maybe don't work in this new environment right now. Mm, Good word. And now I noticed that you mentioned that in your Grow Wild book, nature. What is the role of nature in kind of helping us find that balance and get the right amount of movement nutrients in? Oh my gosh. Well, nature is everything, right? So, you know, as I'm sitting here on a computer inside a building full of stuff, looking at the walls, it's really easy to look at all of this and think that this is the world, but this is not the world. This is just a very big beaver dam that I've created using other parts of nature to sort of assemble around me to protect me. But as we lose sight of the fact that humans are an animal too, you know, part of the animal kingdom that uses nature just like all other animals, it's really important to remember that one, we're not the only humans around. It's really challenging to not confuse your culture with humanity, I guess is an easier way of saying it. There's many humans that live much different lives than the ones that we live. And so when you have that sort of cross-cultural perspective, it's really easy to be like, okay, well, humans, again, because we're outliers in behavior, humans are very used to and have the equipment to spend the bulk of their time, I would say, out of their shelter, to be in in nature, or we're going to say out of the house, simply outdoors. And abundance of movement that I'm talking about is really the movements that you get when you are outside more and you are moving for the things that you need, when you're actually trying to directly exchange your labor for the stuff that you need. So in these times, probably for most listeners right now, that would be the difference between growing some food or not growing some food or growing plant, you know, food for pollinators. Like, so having a garden, there's a lot of movement to be found in a garden. You're growing movement when you grow a garden. And so A lot of Grow Wild is your listeners are probably tuned into the fact that many children have nutritional deficiencies. Many humans have nutritional deficiencies. I'm saying that there's also many movement deficiencies. And then there are other experts who will say, and children also have huge nature deficiencies right now. But you know, the the term vitamin nature was coined because again, what happens is you can use nature sort of as a medicine to restore. They're finding that, oh, in these situations, what kids, like kids are undernatured. And so when you put them back into that environment, some of their symptoms go away. And so a lot of my work is to say, as a parent or as really any human trying to kind of optimize your well being, it gets overwhelming when they say, oh, no, you have to learn an entire new, new way to eat. You have to cook food and you have to do all these things and, and learn about all these things. And then someone adds movement and then someone adds nature, it's like way overloading. Like Mm -hmm. it's too much. What I'm trying to explain is they're all the same deficiency. Your nutritional deficiencies are a result of your movement and nature deficiencies that if you were extracting your food directly with your body, directly from the landscape, you would have the most nutritious, nature-rich, movement-rich version. But as we've pulled ourselves in and away from nature and foods that come from nature and using movements that come from nature, now everything's sort of synthetic and separate. So we live in, our dwellings are sort of synthetic. The foods are synthetic, meaning that they're not whole. I mean, like, I guess you can just use the same way that you perceive whole food, this idea that it's not only not so packaged, but it hasn't been processed, right? It looks it looks very mm-hmm. close to its source in nature. And so that's the same thing for movements, right? We're looking for the movements that look very close to a human just moving through nature because that's their source, of course. But why were humans moving through nature? Humans are only motivated to move through nature for food. That's the natural relationship. Food and movement have always been intrinsically intertwined and the landscape upon which all of that was happening was nature. And as we sit in this like ultra modern environment, it's easy to get confused that it's always been this way, but it hasn't. This is an extremely rare and new scenario. And there are many humans living on the planet right now, not in this sort of outlying scenario. So just to keep that in mind, lest we get confused over what it is that we actually 
require, I guess. So yeah, so that's what nature is. So like when you improve your nature time, increase your competency in it, then you can use your nature time for food. You can use your nature time for movement and then you're getting all of the things that you need at once. So that's sort of my, what I call a stack your life approach where you're finding the tasks that are improving all of your biological or nutritional deficiencies at the same time. I love it. It reminds me of my friend that I interviewed not too long ago, the fit farmer. And he's like, I don't have to go to a gym. (laughs) I'm in God's gym here. Like he's, you know, hoeing and he's doing labor, as you said, not in a sterile environment inside with the rubber and the machines. And he can simply split logs for his family's fireplace or work the grounds that he can better grow the vegetables he's growing. So yeah, so I get it. We're kind of so far removed when it's all of a piece. So I'm so intrigued and so happy that we've had this conversation. I just want to pose to you the question I often pose at the end, and it can be related to what we've already discussed, or it can be something personal that you want to share. If the listener could do one thing to improve their health, if they could just do one thing, Katie, what would you recommend that they do? Walk. Walk more. Walk and walk and walk. You can't walk too much? I don't think, well, I might, might not be the right person to ask, So, because 20-mile walks <laughs> are part of my regular monthly thing. But yes, I mean, walking is is very important, not only to the body, it's important to communities. It's important to really the shape that society is going. So active transport is included in that. So you can add cycling too, but but walking and cycling are so different that we really just want to make sure that the preservation of the practice of walking occurs. And the one way you can do that, like the one, the version of saving the seeds is taking walks and teaching your children to walk for transport, not only for fun, not only for fitness. Wonderful. Katie, thank you so much for taking the time today. Really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you for having me. Our guest today was Katie Bowman. Visit her website, nutritiousmovement.com. And I'm Hilda Labrador, the host and producer of this podcast for the Weston A. Price Foundation. Check out my website, holistichilda.com. And for the transcript for this podcast episode, visit our website, westonaprice.org, and click on the podcast page. And now for a recent review from Apple Podcasts. This podcast and others like it needs a much bigger audience. From Lacey Scott. Lacey says, I pray for a day when information like this will become widespread. Lacey, thank you so much for this review. It matters. Every review lets listeners know or potential listeners know that the show is worth checking out. So thank you. And you too may leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you're so inclined. And maybe one day you'll also get a shout out here at the end of the program. So thank you so much for listening. Stay well, my friend. Hasta pronto. On behalf of the Weston A. Price Foundation, thanks for listening. We have many free resources to support you on your health journey. Visit WestonAPrice.org to find podcasts, articles, videos, and more. You can also find a local chapter near you for help in finding sources of great food. We invite you to support the Foundation's mission of education, research, and activism by becoming a member. Thanks again, and take care. Wise Traditions is a project of the Weston A. Price Foundation for wise traditions in food, farming, and the healing arts. The content on this podcast is provided for informational purposes only and is not intended to substitute for the advice provided by your doctor or other healthcare professional. It is not intended to be, nor does it constitute healthcare or medical advice.